Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. I feel like my vision is, I'm going to get my glasses. I'm having trouble seeing a little bit. I just wanted to formally thank everyone for their prayers. Um, I'm feeling a lot better. Um, not out of the woods yet, but I am feeling a lot better. I have a few, so a few doctor's appointments coming up in the month of October, so hopefully um, things will be resolved. Amen. But um, I believe in God's miraculous healing power, yeah. and I believe that I have been healed, and I believe that I'm moving forward. And so I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your continued prayers, and I am doing a lot better. So I, I praise God that I'm able to stand before you because at one point I didn't know if I was going to have to ask someone to fill in um, with just not being able to stand for a long time and getting dizzy and that kind of thing. So I, I'm really grateful to be here today. I'm grateful that, um, oh no, there's a lot of feedback. Uh, I could use the other mic. Grateful. Uh, I'm grateful um, just to go through this process of ordination. Um, I see it as a process that's just saying that I'm committed to the call of God that God has on me. And I, I thank you that you've been supportive, that you've prayed with me, that you've corrected me, um, and that you've stood alongside this journey that I've gone through, and that it's not necessarily my journey, but it's the journey that we're all taking together, right? Because even though I'm going through this process, you guys have all been ordained, you guys have all been called to do a good work for Jesus Christ, and so even though I'm going through a formal, uh, I guess, a formality of it, I don't want you guys to feel that you don't have something to do um, for the work. In, in kingdom of God. God has called all of us. God has called all of us, and I'm no better than anyone else, but I want you guys to know that you have a calling on your life. You have a calling. There's something important that God wants you to do to bring glory to his name, to, to bring um, more citizens into the kingdom of heaven, and so um, I would say this is a journey that we're all taking together, but I, I praise God that um, I've been able to grow up in this church, and I've been supported by so many of you, and are welcome alongside. So I thank you for the wisdom and for the teaching that I've had under this church. And so as I come before you with um, a word today, I wanted to share um, a little bit of where this is coming from. For a few weeks, I would say probably months, I, I've been grieving. I feel like God's been, sometimes when we grieve, sometimes it's not a grief of personal grief, but sometimes I feel like God gives us a grief to show us how he feels. And, and in that, um, there was a grief where he was showing me that there's a complacency in the church of America. There's a complacency, in, and it's not specifically towards First Wesleyan, and I don't know how applicable it is, but it's, it's something that needs to be stated. There's a complacency in this church of the universal church, specifically in America. And we have allowed generation after generation to be complacent and to lose their focus on the message and gospel of Jesus Christ. So God wants to shift us forward. God wants to transform the church and shift our thinking so that we're moving forward with so God wants to break the cycle of religion, of religion, and begin a cycle of relationship. God wants to break many cycles. Just bear with me, I'm trying to. God wants to break the cycle of being familiar with him and begin a cycle of us having a focused fellowship with him. God wants us to break the cycle of doubting his forgiveness and grace and begin a cycle of walking in it. God wants us to break the cycle of the idea of loving him and begin a relationship of genuine love. 
God wants us to break the cycle that thinking that we are earthly citizens, but us really beginning and walking with the mindset that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. God wants to break the cycle of us thinking that the end goal is only heaven, but begin the cycle of believing and knowing that heaven can come here on earth through the power of Jesus Christ. We have been given power and authority, and God has given us the power to bring heaven here on earth through Jesus Christ. He wants us to shift our mindset. So I'm going to read the passage from Luke 7, 36 through 50. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus, to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet eating, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, would he know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is? That she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Teacher, tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them loved him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Praise God for the reading of this word. Uh, and as I was, I actually was in a devotion a few months back, and, and this was the scripture that came to me. And um, as I was asking, and I was going through this grief of asking, God, what is it? Why, why are we in this place of complacency? Why is this church in this place, and I said, and it's not, and then my question became, what is it about us that grows up in the church versus the one who becomes saved and had no upbringing in the church? There's such a big difference, and I don't think one is better than the other, but I, I believe God gave me the scriptures to show me clarity, and he was saying that there's a love that's lacking. You know, there's a love that's lacking, and, and we grow up with the familiarity of it, but if we're not careful, we carry the spirit of the Pharisees. If we're not careful, we will be carrying the spirit of the Pharisees. And so in our complacency, in, in us knowing the word of God, in us walking in the word of God, in us doing the actions and, um, and going through the motions of church, we have come to a place where we know the word, but the heart is still not there. And so this is not a message to say one Christian is better than the other because that tends to be the route that we go in when we look at the Pharisee versus the woman with sin. This is not about a judgmental, uh, a judgmental uh, I guess, talking about how one part of the church feels more righteous than the other because I don't think that's the issue that God is getting at. But he wants us to look at the condition of what's going on in this story. The condition, the heart, the mindset of what's going on in this story. So who do we identify with, right? So if I had to, uh, if we were to compare and look at this figuratively, 
we would say that the Pharisee would be equal to the religious church, meaning the people, the church of Jesus Christ that has grown up in the church, they know the word of God, the body of believers, but their, their heart is still lacking in love. And then the woman in sin might represent the unchurched believer. But in this message, we're going to focus not necessarily on her, but more so the church. More so the church. And so as we look at the context of this, I want us to, to go back to the beginning of Luke, of, of this passage. And so exactly who were the Pharisees, right? They were a group of religious leaders that had a, a great influence. They had a great influence, not necessarily politically, but religiously. And they were very big on oral tradition. Very big on oral tradition. They wanted to keep the oral tradition of Judaism alive. And so anyone that began to preach a message that they felt threatened their, um, their agenda, they sought fit to find means to, to correct them or to belittle them. So that's who we're dealing with. At, uh, we're talking about the Pharisees here, right? And so now, um, another custom that a lot of people aren't aware of, but um, when it was very common for um, men to gather in the evening during this time to discuss theology. And wherever, whoever was hosting this gathering for this theology discussion, it was, it was very important that the person who was hosting it showed hospi hospitality, right? They, that they were hospitable. And so one of the forms of hospitality that they would do is that they would anoint them when they came into the house, and there was a form of washing the feet because the roads were dirty. And so it was, it was a form of showing respect and saying, you're welcome here, I'm gonna wash your feet so that you can come in and, uh, I guess, and relax and enjoy. And, um, and so, that this was common tradition. This was something that was expected. And if you were like, this was something that was done, right? So like we have traditions when we have guests come over, we might prepare food, we might prepare, and we try to do our best to make sure that when they come into our home, they feel welcome. And so when we're looking at what the Pharisee did, he invited Jesus, so Jesus didn't come there. He was invited over. And so Jesus was invited into the home without any form of hospitality being given to him. Jesus was invited into the home without any form of hospitality being given to him. So the next thing that um, I think when we're looking at context of it, it was also common for these gatherings to take place outside so other people could see what was going on. So it was not uncommon or it's not unlikely like that the woman who came to, to anoint Jesus with her hair and feet saw what was going on and saw that this man, uh, that the Pharisee did not give the respect and the hospitality to Jesus that he deserved. So it's, an, it's while you're in the home, remember that the, the, the I guess the, the setting of the place, it's more of an open gathering, almost thinking of it like in your backyard where your gates are kind of clear for other people to see what's going on. Right? And so while it's by invitation only, the whole neighborhood can see what's happening in your house. Right? So how does that translate to us, right? So when I was thinking about it and I was praying, God was saying we have this spirit of, of being Pharisees in some sense, right? We lack hospitality for the presence of God. We can often have self-righteous opinions. And, and when we talk about self-righteousness, it's not a holier than now, like I'm better than this sinner. But sometimes it's a, a, a self-righteousness towards self, where we believe that we have the right to treat ourselves better or to do for ourselves because we deserve it. And so there's like this constant battle of, of not having the security in Christ and then going back to say, well, I'm going to fix it that on my own. So it's like this two, two thing, double standard thing going on with ourselves. And then there's this lack of true understanding for the forgiveness that results in loving little. 
And so as we shift our mindset, I feel like God wants us and he wants the church to really address three items that we haven't really been addressing wholeheartedly. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. When we look at forgiveness, especially growing up in the church, I think it's something that we're familiar with. And God is saying we're familiar with the forgiveness, but how have you experienced my forgiveness? How have you experienced my forgiveness so much that you can transform the life of someone else? And I want us to understand that our story, right? William McDowell said this in one of his messages that I, I recently listened to. He said, we all have different stories, but we all have the same testimony. We all have different stories, but we all have the same testimony. So what that means, right? I grew up in church. I just drifted out a little bit, but it's nothing compared to someone who never grew up having the word of God in their life. Right? My parents, and I, I was uh, jogging my mom's memory, and I was asking her, what was it like growing up as a child? Because she didn't grow up in the same household. Her household and what she experienced is completely different than what my dad and her together brought into the household for us as kids. And so when we're looking at people or that may not have known Christ, and then they come to Christ, we often think and we, we compare ourselves and we think that we don't have a testimony. We doubt God's forgiveness and we think that his forgiveness and his grace is not sufficient enough because we didn't go through what someone else went through. We didn't have the journey that someone else had, right? And so we often take we often doubt the forgiveness that's being offered because the story is so familiar. We grow up with a familiar story of forgiveness, but we don't always accept it because we think that our sin wasn't enough. We think our sins are silly, or we think that our sins aren't enough to bring to God for him to cover us. Or you have the opposite, where we have people who grow up in church and they think that you have to experience the world to come back into church with a testimony. And God is saying, shift your mindset. My forgiveness is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. I do not want you to think that you have to experience X, Y, and Z to think that you need that for my grace. That you need that for my forgiveness. The commonality between the debtor that had 500 denarii and the other one with 50, the common denominator is that they both needed a debt paid. Right, right. Whether you don't have 500 and the other doesn't have 50, neither one of you have anything to pay the debt. So at the end of the day, we have to stop comparing our journey to other people. Yes. We have to walk in the confidence that God has given us and know that the forgiveness that he has offered is enough. It has covered you. His forgiveness has covered you. His forgiveness has covered you. His forgiveness has covered you. And your debt has been paid. Your debt is clean. You are now purified through Jesus Christ. And now we all can walk with the same testimony. So it does not matter what my mother's story is. It doesn't matter what my story is. We all have the same testimony. We all have the same testimony. And so sometimes our complacency comes from doubt. Our complacency comes from doubt. The Pharisees had Jesus right in front of their face and they said, who is this man that forgives sins? We can often doubt the blessing that is right in front of us. God wants us to shift and understand that it is more than enough. More than enough. Faith versus action. Faith versus action. And so if we look at the ending part of the scripture, right? And I'm going back and forth in my computer versus this. I'm trying to make sure I'm in sync. We have faith versus action. I'm going to go back real quick. And for those of you who are following me online, I can send a PowerPoint if you would like to go through this. 
um, later on. I know it was hard to see while we were looking online. We often misinterpret faith versus action. Faith versus action. The woman came before him and she, she went to Jesus, wiping his feet with her tears and her hair. She anointed his feet with oil. And there was an action that was taken that the Pharisees misunderstood. There was an action that was taken that the Pharisees misunderstood. And so Jesus then says to the woman, it is your faith that has saved you. It is your faith that has saved you. What happened with the woman, and if you go back to the beginning of the passage, there was something where it said that she learned that Jesus was there, right? In verse 37, a woman in a town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So we don't know exactly what that encounter meant, but whatever happened, it changed her for her to want to go to Jesus and start anointing him, to show him this hospitality that wasn't given to him before. There was a transformation that took her to his feet. There was a transformation that took her to his feet to show how much she loved him. It wasn't her action, though, that saved her. It was not her actions that saved her. It was her faith. It was her faith. And so we have to make sure that regardless of where we are, we are not acting without faith. We want to make sure that we are moving. Everything that happens is in sync, right? So in Ephesians 2, 8, um, Julia read part of the entire passage from 1 to 10. But it says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is through faith that we are saved. It is by faith that we believe that we are forgiven. It is by faith that we have been redeemed and washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. It is by faith that we believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. It is by faith that we believe these things that hold us true to the Word of God. It is by faith, and it is not from ourselves. It is a gift from God. And so it's not by works so that no one can boast. No one can boast. There's... God wants us to shift our mindset in regards to faith. Some of us have faith, but we leave it there. Some of us have action with no faith. Some of us take action, but we're not led in our action by faith. And so we have to make sure that everything that we do is coinciding with one another, right? If, I, if God tells me to move, I have to trust and have faith that that was his direction. And then my movement should then be out of love for God Right? My movement should now be, I'm going to be obedient, not because um, I don't want to do it. I know we have our moments when we really don't feel like doing things. Like, God, really? Really now? Like, you want me to pray now? Do you know how many times or how annoying it is to wake up in the middle of the night and lose sleep? And then I realize that the reason why God woke me up is because he has something to say. Go read this scripture. Go sit in silence. I have something to say to you. And you're like, I really want to go to sleep. Why now? Why now? But that's the only time I'm not distracted, right? That's the only time for me that I'm not distracted, right? And so I don't know what it is for you or what, um, what actions that God is requiring me to take, but we have to take a step and a leap of faith knowing that if we're moving in a specific direction, if God says, this is the plan I have for you, Sherilyn and Charmaine, you guys are taking an action of faith and you're trusting that God is going to guide your footsteps, right? And so this is, this is something that we are trusting God to do continuously. And what has happened is that it, someone can assume that Jesus loves the woman more than he did the Pharisee. But it wasn't, that wasn't the case. It wasn't the case at all. He knows our heart. He loves us all the same. What he, what, what we, what we get confused with is that we think we put God in this box and we tell ourselves that God sees us differently than the other person. Yeah. 
This is not the word of God. God didn't say, I love you little. Our response is little. Our response is little. It's not that he loves us less. Our response is little, but we don't understand the forgiveness that God has given to us. And so faith versus action. So faith is a requirement to be saved. Faith without works is dead. The Bible tells us that um, how can you clothe someone or how can someone be in need and you say, go, go in peace. But you have not done anything to clothe them or to help them out, right? And so there is a common sense to our action. But our action has to be done in sync with the faith in Jesus Christ. Because then if we move and we have works without faith, Christ's sense of faith, it leads to a road of self-righteousness and destruction. You know, one of the, the biggest things that I think that um, God wants us to, to make sure that we're doing right now in regards to action, right? Especially with a lot of the things that are going on in this country. There are many forms and many different ways we can take action with a lot of the things that's going on. But we have to make sure that however God moves us, Whatever steps we take, they are Christ-centered. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there are a lot of charities doing good work, but they're not bringing glorification to the, to the name of Jesus Christ. There are a lot, of, a lot of organizations bringing awareness and doing good things, but it's in the name of self-righteousness. And if we're not careful, we can end up with the ideology that one race is better than the other. That we are better than the other. And that's not biblical. It's not biblical. So we have to make sure that when God takes us and says, Brother Tony, this is what I want you to do. Sister Sandra, this is what I want you to do. Brother Carl, this is what I want you to do. Whenever we take steps and we are moving in action, whether it's legal action, legislative action, whether it's action, whatever it is that we're doing, faith, our faith in God should be centered in Jesus Christ. Our faith should be centered in Jesus Christ because he doesn't want us to bite the bait of deception. Do not bite the bait of deception. There are so many things out there that Satan is trying to do to get us astray. I appreciate Marie's prayer. I really did. And it, not necessarily for me, but for our children and for this church and to make sure that we're really not moving away from the kingdom of God. We're, if we're not careful, we can lose the message of the kingdom, and God really wants us to shift this mindset. Fellowship and faith. Fellowship and faith. So, the last thing that God wants us to, to move and shift our mindset with is understanding what it means to be his disciple. Right? Understanding what it means to follow him. Right? He said, then Jesus said to the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Right? We, we are, there's like the complacency that's sitting in the church. It's almost as if we want to, we believe by faith we're saved, but we're not dying to ourselves to follow Christ. You know how... Um, one of the disciples was like, yeah, I'll follow you. Let me go and, and say goodbye. And he was like, let the dead bury the dead. We often want to look back, and we still want to keep the company that drags us down behind us when God is telling us to move forward. And so when we look at our situation, when we're wondering why healing isn't taking place, when we're wondering why deliverance isn't taking place, when we're wondering why certain circumstances aren't taking place or certain things aren't changing, the question that God has been really at, uh, presenting to me is, have you been seeking my kingdom? Have you been seeking my kingdom? It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And so it's the kingdom seeking comes first, then everything else comes. And so when we ask for things to happen and we're not seeking the kingdom, we're treating God as if he's a genie. We're treating God as if he is just this abracadabra magician, magician, and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. God is requiring us 
to seek his kingdom. To seek his kingdom first. To seek his kingdom first. And then lastly, fellowship. Embracing the presence of God. You will show me the way of life, granting me joy of your presence and pleasures of living with you forever. How many of you ever done this, right? Like you have your glasses, right? And you go on the search, I can't find my glasses. I can't find my glasses. Where are my glasses? Oh my goodness, I can't find my glasses. And you got a better one for me, right? The other day, my mom, I called my mom, right? And I said, how's Andrew doing? She's like, you know what, she's right here, you speak to her. Do you know Audrey was on the phone with me, and then my mother walked around the house looking for her phone? How many of us have done it? I'm sorry, Mom, I don't mean to put you on blast, right? But it happens, right? And so the thing that we are using right in front of us, we, my glasses are here, but I'm not wearing them correctly, right? I'm not wearing them correctly, and so now I go on this mission, and I'm going on this hunt, looking for something, and it's right in front of me, but I'm not using it correctly. Wow. God is saying, you grew up in my presence. You have, you're comparing yourself to unbelievers that might find me. You think that you have to experience that, but you don't realize the blessing of me keeping you. You don't realize what I've done by keeping you in my presence. You don't realize the, the, the spiritual warfare and the angels have, that have fought on your behalf to keep you here. And then we go out looking for other things to fill voids in our hearts while the presence of God is right in the midst of us. Right in the midst of us. So it's like us wearing our glasses, looking for them, and it's right in the midst of us, but we won't put them on. We won't put them on. God is saying that we have to shift our mindset. We have to shift our mindset. God's forgiveness is enough. God's forgiveness is enough for you. The faith that he has um, given us and planted in us by the spirit of God, that is enough to move us forward. It's enough to move us forward. And the fellowship that we have with him will cause us to love him more and more so that whatever we do, is reflecting the image of Christ. It's reflecting the image of Christ. God really wants us to really move from the idea of being earthly citizens. We are storing up way too many treasures here on earth that are gonna perish. And if we're not careful, we're gonna die with them. If we're not careful, we're gonna die with them. God needs the church to move forward. God wants a paradigm shift in our thinking, in our mentality. There are too many people in need of deliverance. There are too many people with generational curses on their families, and nothing is being done. Because our mindset has not changed. Our mindset has not changed. We're still storing up treasures on earth. We still make up these excuses and say, this is what God, that's, this is what it is. And we walk with this mentality like we have to be enslaved to, to bitterness, like we have to be enslaved to poverty. That's not the life that God desires for us. But when we choose to not walk in the mindset of as a kingdom of citizen, we walk and we allow society, we allow the labels that they have placed on us, and we walk in no self-fulfilling prophecies instead of the prophecy that God has for us. Instead of the prophecy that God has for us. And so as we look at scripture, as we meditate on change, let us not be a church of the Pharisee. We don't have time to play the games of, well, the Bible says this, you can't do this. Right? Because, I mean, while the Bible does have laws, and they have um, their the commandments, right? And the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he commands us to move. Some of us can be so religious and get so caught up with our cultural traditions that we think that's what being saved is. God wants us to let it all go. He wants a true relationship with you. He wants you to understand that the forgiveness that he has given you, the debt for him going 
out of his way. I wouldn't even say out of his way because he loves us so much. But the plan that he had to restore us, to bring us back to the kingdom that Adam and Eve first experienced through Jesus Christ is enough. So this is a challenge for us as we raise our children. This is a challenge for us as we pray to break generational curses in our family. This is a challenge to us as we seek to see First Wesleyan Church change and make changes in the community. We have to change our mindset. We want to see change in this country, but it starts with the church. It starts with the church, and we have to change our mindset and know what it is that God has planned for us. His forgiveness is enough. How much do we trust him to walk in that calling? And how much are we willing to sacrifice our own agenda to be in the presence of God? Because tapping into his presence is not, I want to say it's hard, but when we're distracted and we have our own agenda, it's very hard to get into it. Because we're not dying to self. So, as we think, as we reflect, as we look at where we are, when we look at this parable and the story, Our prayer is very simple. May every action, God, that we take be directed by our faith and done in love. Done in love. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, O oh God. We thank you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you 